Florida, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Monday. It's April the 21st, 2014. If you celebrate Easter, I hope you had a nice holiday with your family. If you don't celebrate Easter, if you didn't celebrate this Easter, hope you had a nice relaxing weekend. We did both. We celebrated Easter, and we had a nice relaxing weekend. Our resident conspiracy scientist, Robert Morningstar, is back with us this evening. We were honored to have Robert as our first guest three weeks ago when we rebooted Far Out Radio. The month of March saw a lot of earthquake activity with a few biggies going off in Chile in uh, South America. And in other places of the planet, the earth was doing a lot of grumbling. Uh, low-level shakes, but with unusual frequency. Now, the last time that Robert was with us, he explained that the planet was about to encounter a unique planetary uh, alignment in the next coming weeks, uh, as well as a full, a full moon and a lunar eclipse. That was the blood moon from a week ago this evening on the 14th. Uh, and one can only speculate and guesstimate the effects of so many planetary alignments in conjunction with the water pressure that's always generated with a new moon and a full moon, plus a lunar eclipse. And this lunar eclipse earthquake angle is very, very interesting because often major quakes pop off shortly after eclipse events. It's, uh, it's a real unusual, uh, strange thing. Now, Robert's been with us many times in the past, and you can enjoy all of his previous visits by checking out our archives page. Uh, once you go there, the easiest way to find Robert's uh, programs is to just use your find tool in the browser and put in his name. Unfortunately, the recording for our reboot program on March 31st with Robert suffered a terminal glitch and was not playable. So you won't be able to go back and hear part one of this conversation, but we'll do a recap if you happen to miss the live recording. The shows we did last October and November with Robert on the topic of the JFK assassination were very very good, especially the hollow, the Halloween program with Robert, and these are definitely in the archives. Robert is the co-editor of UFO Digest. He's a psychotherapist in New York City with a degree from Fordham University, and he's an expert in the Chinese language and history and martial arts. He's also an FAA licensed pilot with 20, over 23 years of flying experience, and he's been studying UFOs and the paranormal for over 40 years not counting it over time. Now, if you'd like to follow Robert's work, it's very easy. He's a very active fellow on Facebook, so if you go to Facebook and just put his name in that search, uh, you'll find his uh, listing. He's the one with the big smiling dolphin. Uh, Robert posts lots of interesting finds and curiosities. So having said all that, Robert, are you there? Welcome back to the program. Guys, do we have Robert? Do we have Robert? Hey, Scott, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. Having... I'm fine. And now our phones are fine. Great. <laughs> I had a wacky time waiting. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I was kind of wondering. I was sort of cut out there in, in nothing land. Anyway, how have you been? Oh, very busy. Uh, extremely busy. And I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling like spring is trying to break out here in New York, but it's having a tough time. Yeah. It was a very nice day today. Now, I've Just been a week ago, uh, friends of ours back in Medford, New Jersey, where we used to live, reported uh, told us that they had another little dose of snow. So oh, uh, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Last last um, what was it Friday or something? I went out and I, it was like spring when I walked out of my door, and I thought I had overdressed. I always wear a jumpsuit or a flight suit, a heavy one for winter, and I thought I'd overdressed. I walked outside; it felt like spring. I walked up the block. It got 15 degrees colder in just one block. Mm -hmm. Started to cross yeah. the street, and I started to get hit by snow. And then this snowstorm came that lasted exactly one hour. But at a certain point in the West Side Highway, I was being buffeted at a light. I would, my car, the 96 Firebird, was shaking from the buffeting of the wind and the, the smashing of about an inch and a half of snow that came down in an hour. And then it disappeared instantly. It, it was like being in a hurricane of snow for a moment. It was a uh, whiteout moment. It was pretty wild. Well, well oh, this is told obviously you. a winter. <laughs> a winter, people in the Northeast won't forget anytime soon. Uh, but I think that these these uh, recent weather disturbances have been due to the uh, Martian maelstrom, which was one of the subjects of our last conversations. And we're going to mm -hmm. we're pick up about earthquakes today, and sure. um, so. Strange, uh, really strange weather, and even stranger weather is coming because I was looking at the weather map 
and a strange, uh, a very strong disturbance is coming down over uh, Yukon, British Columbia, Idaho, with really frigid air, while all this warm, moist air is just barreling up the middle of the country from the Gulf of Mexico, straight up the center of the country. That hot, wet air is going to create a vortex with this, um, this, well, it's kind of an Alberta clipper that's not in Alberta, you know? It's in British Columbia at the moment. And, and it, you know, how people don't understand how an Alberta clipper works, but so I'd like to explain that the cold air is very, very dense, and it's being kept up there by a certain amount of pressure from the continental uh, climate that we have in the central United States and the south. The heat and the high pressure keeps pushing and pushing and pushing up and creates a wall of air uh, around the Arctic. And that air in the Arctic is always getting colder and colder and colder. So where does it go? It grows up vertically. And then this, and of course, cold air is heavier than, than warm air. At a certain point, that cold air grows so high over the North Pole and the Arctic that it squishes down and it starts to basically drip. But the drip turns into uh, gale force winds at times, depending on the terrain, because the topography, for example, the Rocky Mountains, the U.S. Rockies and the Canadian Rockies cre- create kind of funneling effects and create vortexes and wild stuff. So you can expect that. As I see it, I just saw it this afternoon because I checked the weather uh, for my schedule of athletic activities in coming days, see if I'm going to be outdoors or just, you know, hanging upside down indoors. Right. So that's uh, the story. And there are two little quakes today on the ascent, right on the San Andreas Fault, one on the southern end near the border of uh, the Mexico-U.S. border, and the other one is uh, closer to California. They're really small. You know, in the 2.5 uh, range, just below 3. But they are indicators. Here, I have them. Let me just give you the exact location. They're just enough to rally your dishes. Yeah, 2.5 in a guanga. And then, and that is, um, uh, that's the one that I say is right near the border, perhaps near San Diego and Tijuana. And the other one farther north in Coalinga. Coalinga, California, and that one was a 2.5. So this is both ends here of the American San Andreas Fault. But there is the Mexican San Andreas Fault. It goes right down the middle of the uh, Southern California, yep. Baja, Baja Peninsula. So everything's kind of quiet. But, you know, Puerto Rico's been really rocking and rolling along with the British and American Virgin Islands. There are clusters there of about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 earthquakes uh, in just the last day. But that's been going in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. I told my super last week to tell his friends, his family in Santo Domingo, that they might have, uh, you know, tremors. Now, that problem in that area shows that the magma and the earth under... That region, you know, from Hispaniola, which is uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. That that's the whole plate right there. That's the northern part of a plate that encompasses Nicaragua, Guatemala, and curves down t- through the Antilles to Venezuela. So, what is the effect of that? I think, uh, honestly, I think I predicted that there'd be sinkholes in Florida a couple of weeks ago, maybe when I spoke to you and some other people. Yes. Yes, and I noticed uh, yesterday, yesterday or the day before on the Weather Channel that there was, I think, in a place called Deling, Deling, or Delinga, um, Florida, mm-hmm. huge, uh, huge sinkhole opened up, but it stopped. The, the loss of the house because all of the plumbing and the pipe, the underwater, the underwater, the underground uh, uh, pipe plumbing, uh, Huge field, lines and stuff. Yeah, all of that is holding, was holding the <laughs> superstructure. It's like, 
like it's like functional rebar in the earth. <laughs> well, that's exactly what it looked like. It's, it's a yeah. per- perfect description. When they showed a, a close up, the fellow went up to the edge of the sinkhole and shot in, and that's what it looked like. It looked like all the rebar standing after all the concrete had left. For, for our listeners that might not be into uh, construction methods, rebar is is usually a, a, a lattice work of uh, steel rods that are that are put into the con- they they position them before the concrete's poured and then they pour the concrete on top of the rods and you end up with very very strong concrete. Yep, that's the difference between our, our constructions. The reason there's not so many people are killed in earthquakes in the United States is that we have uh, building uh, industry standards that require rebar. When you see those houses in Turkey in the Middle East, they don't rebar, yeah. and the concrete just crumbles, and they have hundreds, hundreds of deaths all the time yeah. you know, for that simple thing. Um, I remember visiting Nicaragua in 1976, which was about four years. Uh, it was actually three and a half years after their, their terrible earthquake. And my heart goes out to the people of Nicaragua now because they have suffered a, such a magnitude of ongoing earthquake of which you have heard nothing unless you listen to uh, Spanish television news or Spanish radio. There hasn't been a peep, but Nicaragua got rocked at 7.6, 6.8, 6.6, 6.1, 5.6, on and on and on, day after day. And that was just uh, last week. Around the why do you think that doesn't get reported, Robert? Well, because they've they've got us uh, in a distracted state, and if you watch CNN, the only thing on your mind is going to be the uh, MH370 mm-hmm. uh, airliner, of which they haven't found a single shred of evidence in the water. You would think that if they got a ping from a certain area, which they started saying two weeks ago. And if they thought uh, they knew generally where it had crashed, right, that you would find a piece of styrofoam, a seat, yes. a seat cushion, a seat cover, yes. a piece of baggage, a floating pe- uh, item from, uh, you know, like shaving cream or whatever. Yeah, all the, all the no, stuff that we take no with thing. us on the airplane, all the stuff that's in your suitcase, Something had, you know, would have broken. And so the reason it's not, you're not finding anything because that's not where the plane went. I sent an interesting email to uh, Fox News. I have some friends there uh, in the editing department. And I sent them an item that no one else seems to have carried. It came from the uh, United, uh, United Kingdom, a UK Mirror, or the Daily Mirror over there. And it was a report mm-hmm. from a Russian intelligence source that said that they had... Uh, concluded that the airplane had been hijacked by a gang of terrorists and that it had been taken north into Afghanistan to be used as a weapon and that the people had been uh, taken off the plane and split off into groups and dispersed to be held as uh, potential uh, prisoners for ransom or exchange. And Fox News was the only uh, station that carried that. Very few others, uh, I know, no others. I didn't see it on uh, CNN or anything. Well, kudos to Fox. Kudos to Fox, because, while. you know, General McInerney, who was uh, the uh, chief of the Air Force at one time and very and maybe even uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he kept saying that he thought the plane had been taken north and into Pakistan. And his, his scenario, his description, his uh, analysis, seemed most coherent, cogent, and logical to me. And he said, no. I said to myself, why would the guy turn the plane to Antarctica? And if he wanted to crash, why go crash in Antarctica? You know, he would make a statement really closer to home so that people would know that uh, he had a gripe about the trial of his uh, his guru or his uh, spiritual teacher. So I don't, I don't believe any of those stories. It's, oh, I know. Uh, it's, it's a waste of time. As far as concerned, it's a waste of time to watch it because they're just harping on that all the time. You get no other news, like the Bundy Ranch, uh, and off. And thank God, you know, I, I wrote to Fox News. I'm re- I really admire them, and I wrote to them, and I said, in all honesty, I think you saved the lives of the Bundy family. 
you hadn't been there, I think there would have been another Waco massacre, something I never want to see again. Well, it certainly was lining up to 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 look that way, and uh, yeah. Now, so if you, uh, I didn't watch television for years and years, and then when we moved, we got a new cable set up and a new TV, and you know we had free HBO for a year. Yay! The only thing is, is there's nothing on there you want to we want to watch. So, but you know, just getting used to the new system, I went looking through the cable, and I, after a couple of weeks, I said, well, I didn't miss anything. So, enough of that nonsense, Robert. But back us up just a little bit to three weeks ago when it was looking, you know, from from the perspective of uh, you know the, the day before uh, April the first, uh, that you know we had coming up these planetary alignments plus the full moon plus the blood moon with the eclipse. What did things look like from that perspective, and uh, you know how did things fare out from there? Well, you know the whole thing started for me in, in a very odd, off the cuff uh, manner. I was on coast to coast AM on the 21st, and in the course of the conversation at the end, uh, George Nori happened to ask me something that, uh, you know, related to um, earth changes and earthquakes, and I said to him, just off the top of my head, because this has been gestating for many years, I've been doing this work for many years, at least every year since 2007, and even earlier intermittently when I started to see the pattern, I said to him, listen, I can't tell you the exact date when this, uh, these events are going to happen, but I can tell you around the time it will happen, it, the most likely time that it will happen will be if there is a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse over San Diego or Madagascar. Madagascar is exactly the opposite side of the Earth. If you mm-hmm. went right through the Earth, uh, through the center of the Earth and put your finger through it, the finger would come out in the ocean off Madagascar. And... So, if there's an eclipse, I said, if there's an eclipse over San Diego or over Madagascar, that's the point at which it's most likely to happen. So then I forgot about it. Then I heard this blood moon thing was coming along. And then I said, let me see where that's going to happen. And it turned out to be in the Pacific, not over San Diego, thank God, but off the coast, uh, if you drew a line directly west, from Peru, and directly south from Los Angeles, where those two lines intersected, that is approximately where the eclipse uh, happened and was to happen when I was doing this analysis. So it just turns out that it's on one of those, uh, right over one of the major plates in the uh, eastern Pacific, the plate that holds Peru, Colombia, right along and the Peru, and Chile. Yeah, it, no, this, actually this one is, yeah, if you include the Cocos Plate and the Nazca, uh, the Nazca Plate and the Cocos Plate, it is Ring of Fire, uh, the, most, the, the most fiery of uh, all the countries in Central America is Nicaragua. It's got a load of volcanoes. In 1976, uh, I visited Managua, which was four years after the first earthquake uh, of 72, and I looked out and I saw three volcanoes all spewing black smoke. And that it, must it, have looked prehistoric. Oh, it was prehistoric, exactly. I said, you know, I looked at it and I said, oh my God, where's the dinosaur? Yeah, it was where's a, the brontosaurus? There's a place in Nicaragua that uh, the Jesuits used to think was the entrance to hell, a, a volcano, really? and, and the city is called Masaya. That's the same thing. <laughs> Messiah in Nicaragua has a volcano that the Jesuits believe was uh, an entrance into Tartarus or the the underworld hell. It's quite a, huh. a, a foreboding foreboding place. But anyway, this the the wave, uh, tectonic wave that this um, eclipse caused, has caused accidents and mishaps, and uh, I ascribe the loss of that. Uh, South Korean ferry is something that I specifically said was going to happen and that is the tidal bulge when the lunar eclipse occurs it's lined up Earth Sun Moon and in this case it was Mars and Saturn in the background two more other and and Antares the star Antares was there it's the most massive star or was the most massive star known to humanity 
until Robert, it's just... let's uh, let's expound on these uh, alignments on the other side of the break. We got our music playing, so we'll be back in about three minutes. If you just joined us, Robert Morningstar is back with another visit. We're talking about recent earthquake activity, and you keep up with Robert's work. He's the co-editor at UFO Digest, and also he's very very active in Facebook. Just put in Robert Morningstar and look for the dolphin. We'll be right back. And we are back. If you're just joining us, Robert Morningstar is back with us this evening for another visit, and uh, we're talking about things that are shaking and quaking. Robert, before we dig into it, before I, and before I forget, I got to tell you, I was on your Facebook page this afternoon, and I about fell out of my chair over that that picture of the that you have on your Facebook page. I, I think it's called the the effect of global warming on on the Statue of Liberty or something like that. <laughs> that's, that's that is my too Ron funny. Regina. But for for our listeners, if you want to have a good laugh, go to uh, Robert Morningstar's Facebook page and scroll down a little bit. You won't miss it. It's a that's a that's a great uh, Photoshop uh, effort there. Yeah, that, I want to thank Ron Regeer. He's one of my great friends and a uh, great resource and a good supporter. And he's been contributing a lot of uh, humor to to my page. Ron Regeer is a former aerospace engineer who worked uh, uh, in the space program in the 60s and 70s and uh, one of the most knowledgeable people uh, about almost anything, actually. You know, a man of all, uh, jack of all trades, master of none, and master of many, actually. And he Great. created that graphic? Um, I don't know that he did, but I know that he posted it. It's very mischievous. Oh, okay. All right. I paid. Well, I give a lot of wherever you are out there, good job, bravo. I encourage okay, everyone. We were, well, on the other side, uh, Robert, we were talking about these uh, these planetary uh, celestial alignments uh, with the Earth that all coincided with this uh, window of opportunity with the blood moon. So uh, elaborate a little bit on that for us, if you would. Okay. Well, I was uh, talking about the, the various kinds of changes that, that this uh, does. And one of the main things is our tidal effect. There is uh, something called a tidal bulge that occurs uh, during... Uh, the tidal bulge occurs, uh, you know, at a full moon and also new moon, but it's more pronounced when there's an eclipse. And as I predicted, that after the tidal bulge subsided, there would be strange tides in in the Pacific in particular. Also over that in that area is He's called actually the, uh, the Indian Ocean and uh, or Madagascar and the Seychelles Islands. And so I ascribe the loss of the ferry to this uh, ignorance on the part of the captain and the crew <clears throat> that this uh, tidal effect would happen. The only other person who I think uh, really got it, got it right and hit the nail right on the head, all people, is a young meteorologist on CNN, who was on that night, and he came on and he said, oh yeah, everybody's blaming the captain, and but nobody knows what really happened, but I think it was this. There was a lunar eclipse that day, and that lunar eclipse caused a strange tide, and it caused the lowest, the lowest low mean tide of the year. Now that means that the ocean was... Uh, two feet or so uh, shallower in that region than was expected. The other possibility, if people don't realize, but the seafloor rises and sinks with earthquakes. And during that previous week and that day, Japan, Siberia, the Philippines, um, every you know, the, the ring of fire, I kept saying it's ringing like a bell, and it continues. I'm looking at it right now. And... Uh, Peru and, uh, not Peru, but Chile is still rocking with 4.1s and 5s. And so that's the kind of thing that uh, that I can see that is uh, potential to happen. And so I try to warn people, my friends who are in those areas, to just be alert. What else can I say? Just be ready. Don't, so you're not taken by surprise. I wrote to some friends, if this big one happens, you know, your car should be full of gasoline. Uh, your trunk should be full of food, and your car should be pointing east, get on the other side of the San Andreas Fault if anything happens. So those are just common sense precautions, and um, I don't think there's anything alarmist about it, because I am discussing something 
real, tangible, and it actually did happen. You know, what I the big one that I was afraid was going to happen in California happened over there in uh, Papua and the Solomon Islands. They were getting rocked for days with seven seven magnitude earthquakes of sixes, and they're still ringing like a bell. Yeah, what were the numbers on those two quakes near Chile? That, that there was a second, there was a big one, and then there was a second, that second one that by itself would have qualified right. as a major earthquake. But they called right. it an aftershock. First one, it, one was an eight. That was the biggest one they got. And then they had two that were in the seven, and several that were in the sixes. It, it was like diminishing in intensity. But I said to, I think I said to you, you know, they're calling them aftershocks. But if they were the first shock, they'd say it's the most devastating earthquake they've had in ages. There's a seven, yeah. a six. Those are big, giant quakes already. Now, here's the... Why do they still use... Robert, why do they... Do you know why they still use that, that Richter scale? Because it's, it's very confusing to... You know, you hear about a seven, eight, and you go, oh, well, seven to eight. You know, we think that they're incremental, but they're not. They're exponential. No, they're why do they yeah. use that system? I don't know. It's just uh, the, way, the way that... Um, the science was established. Uh, you know, Richter was the, the first man that really did a lot of work in, in the field of earthquakes. And so, uh, I guess to honor him, he established the standard, and no one really has come up with with another one since that time. But, mm. um, so I guess that's the reason. <laughs> so, thank Mr. Richter for whatever he did. Because, uh, oh, okay. Oh, you, Thanks. you do. Thanks. You know what? An- another thing that's been on my mind is right now there are seven scientists in Italy in jail for five years because they were volcanologists and seismologists, and they had a presentiment that there was going to be a major earthquake in Italy uh, years ago. And they were afraid to be wrong, and they were afraid to panic the people. Those are the two excuses the scientists give for not, not squeaking up, you know? You know the saying, what are you, a man or a mouse? Squeak up. Well, they don't squeak up. They stay mute. They don't, uh, you know, and so they didn't say anything. And when the earthquake did unfold and hundreds of people, or a hundred plus people were killed and the whole town devastated, the Italian government took these scientists to task and uh, charged them with uh, negligence and uh, involuntary manslaughter and... uh, you know, it's a real... Italy is a place that loves scapegoating. <laughs> but the Amanda, the Amanda Fox trial should have missed us all of that. Mm-hmm. But they went after these scientists, and they, they convicted them. Scientists have a civic and a social responsibility to share what they know, especially if, especially if the government is funding, people are funding the research. And we have right. these seismic stations that are there for that purpose. So these men knew that there was going to be this major earthquake, but because of the War of the World Syndrome and the Egg of the Face Syndrome, right? War of the World Syndrome, you drive people into a panic, nothing happens. And the Egg on the Face Syndrome is, I was wrong, and I, uh, you know, so, but I don't, I'm not afraid to get egg on my face. Uh, it's, it's worse and I feel bad right now, actually. It's worse to have known and not to have spoken. And I wrote to a friend... Oh, yeah. yeah I, I understand what you mean. we got to take our break here, Robert. And That's that's an interesting little factoid about the Italians. And uh, yeah. uh, it makes me wonder, gee, what, what kind of economic forecast would we get if we held economists to those same standards here in America? Oh, we don't want to think about that. Okay, we're going to take our break. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Be right back. The business owners. Possibly your ideal clients or customers are just like you. People who enjoy in-depth, insightful interviews not normally heard on mainstream media. Far Out Radio with Scott Teeters is actively marketed to Rents.com readers with banner ads and is supported with pages and archived programs at RentsRadio.com. The popular show has a growing base of loyal fans and is promoted on its own site, FarOutRadio.com and has an aggressive social media campaign. And now you can benefit from this remarkable new program. Contact FarOutRadio.com for very affordable online and on-air advertising opportunities. That's FarOutRadio.com. 
Okay, welcome back to uh, Far Out Radio as we slide into our last segment with our guest, Robert Morningstar. Robert, I was wondering with regard to these uh, planetary alignments, I've heard many uh, physics people make the distinction that the the force of gravity is one of the weakest forces uh, in the cosmos. And I was just wondering that when you get these large planetary bodies aligned uh, in an alignment the way that we uh, experienced in the last couple of weeks, is there a compounding effect that that goes exponential? Well, the effect... People argue that uh, one of the arguments about this Martian uh, maelstrom effect that I talked about, uh, some people object to it saying that the force of gravity of Mars was too weak and that its electromagnetic field is too weak. But um, I don't believe that weak means uh, ineffectual. I would like to remind everybody that the atom is the nucleus of the atom is, is maintained. The atom is integrity is main called the strong force and the other one is called the weak force. And it's the weak force that keeps the uh, protons uh, from blasting away in the middle of an atom. You know, you've got protons which are positive and you've got neutrons which are neutral that neutralize some of, uh, some of the uh, repulsive effects, but there's something called the weak force that keeps the uh, nucleus of the atom in, in balance. So the word weak... Does mean does not mean ineffective, ineffective, uh, ineffectual, uh, or non-existent. So here's what happened with this last eclipse that really had me concerned. I advanced my uh, astronomy program. Stellarium, by the way, folks. Stellarium is a free software you can download on the internet, and it gives you a very beautiful uh, rendering of the cosmos, and it can. It, you can set it to any date in history. You How do you spell that, Robert? S T E L L A R I U M. Stellarium. Okay. They're up to about Stellarium ten version ten, but whichever one you get, it's a good mm-hmm. little program. So I advanced it for a few days because uh, this we had our chat on the thirty first. So in the first week of April, I got to work on this, and I advanced the Stellarium program to the night of the nights of April 13th through the 15th. I wanted to see what was coming up. So I speeded it up because you can speed up Stellarium to really move very rapidly so that one day goes uh, very quickly. So I advanced it and I start to look at the relationship between uh, Mars and the moon because I really honestly, it's an answer to your question. I wanted to know whether the encounter between the Moon and Mars on April 14th and 15th would be a conjunction or an occultation. An occultation would have been something really amazing to see, and I was hoping that it was an occultation, which means that Mars would have appeared to move uh, behind the Moon, like an eclipse, like the Moon would have eclipsed Mars, and Mm -hmm. Mars would have traveled behind the Moon for maybe an hour and a half, and then emerged on the... It would have disappeared in one side and appeared on the other, but that was not the case. That's what I was thinking might happen. What actually happened was even wilder. I speed up the thing, I start looking at it, and it appears to me that Mars made a circle around the moon. And this is a really special, special uh, confluence of events to create this optical effect. And it was that Mars was in a certain part of the sky, and the moon rose up. And as it rose up, Mars was moving also, and their relative movement, Mars, just moving across in the ecliptic, happened to be following a path that the rise and the fall of the moon made it appear that Mars orbited the moon. But you would have had to be out there for fifteen hours. Watching yeah, that's just night, too. That's just daylight too. Daylight and nightlight. So it's something only an astronomy program or a flying yeah. saucer could provide you, because uh, <laughs> the only thing that would get you from the the light side of the Earth to the dark side of the Earth to see the continuum. That means if you were watching it at night and you saw it go about halfway around, you'd have to zip over to the night side at dawn to be able to see the continuation. But the astronomy program made it happen in visual. And I said to myself, my Lord, that's really a really strange effect because 
I ask people to think about the gravitational forces as uh, like rubber bands, and that you know the the moon has got two rubber bands. The Earth is pulling on the moon, and the moon is pulling on the Earth, and they're also pushing against each other. A very dynamic system. And so with Mars, little rubber band going around the big ones, you know, it would create perturbations and uh, slight, little slight perturbations in the gravitational field, but also importantly, as far as I'm concerned, in the electromagnetic field. And uh, that this would create strange weather effects. And I believe that this is what we're seeing. So that's the, the way the theory works. The other problem we have is that it... Uh, it also happens during solar eclipses, and we're having a so I don't know if you have solar eclipses over America or visible from here, but April 29th is supposed to be a, a night or a day of a solar eclipse, and the solar eclipse also does a similar thing, except it amplifies uh, the forces on one side of the Earth, because you've got the sun on the same side as the moon, and the mass of the sun plus the mass of the moon sum up to pull on the surface of the earth and create a tidal bulge of both ocean and earth. On It rises, it bulges up. Now, when it bulges up and is being held during the eclipse, it is very gradually released as the moon passes and it sinks back down. But that effect goes right through the earth, all the way through the other side. So you can imagine that during a solar eclipse, yeah, this this analogy. One side of the earth, earth bulges up, the water rising toward the moon and the sun during the solar eclipse, and the other side of the earth dimples, like a, a sagging, a sinking, a, a hole, and then suddenly it's all released. Now, the other side of the earth gets a worse and more powerful effect because the side of the earth under the eclipse, facing the eclipse, has the mass of the sun, the mass of the moon, and its surface, the the little area of itself, that's the mass affecting, let's say, the the city directly under. However, the point opposite has the entire mass of the earth between it and the moon and the sun. So that opposite side of the earth is being pulled. The dimple part is being Mm -hmm. pulled by the mass of the sun, the mass of the moon, and the mass of the earth, the whole diameter of the earth. So when that releases, that side gets the worst the worst part of it. And I'm happy to say that my theory was correct. I predicted earthquakes off the coast of Madagascar and they came uh, right on this uh, fault line. I think it's called the Carlisle Fault, or the Carlisle Plate. And um, I said that there would be uh, earthquakes in the, re- in the Middle East, near Turkey and Greece and possibly Israel. They happened in Greece and in Turkey. And uh, Hawaii had uh, some earthquakes during the eclipse. It had earthquakes uh, near the southern island volcanoes. But the main effects of this um, Martian maelstrom occurred in the western Pacific, the Philippines, Papua, New Guinea. The Solomon Islands got rocked. I mean, there were two or three days where they were getting hit with seven. So it's not over, because what I feel happens after everything starts to subside is that another kind of slow wave propagates, a slow wave. Everything just settles slowly. So this wave that I'm talking about is one that went from Chile to Peru with strong earthquakes in Peru. And then there was a delay of a couple of days, and I wrote a friend on... You can read it on on Facebook. I wrote to a friend in, in Costa Rica... Get ready, there might be an earthquake in Costa Rica. It happened in Panama, just a few miles south of the Costa Rican border. And then I said, these things are moving north, and I think Guatemala... Yeah, I didn't want to wish anything bad on Nicaragua, uh, because of what they had already gone through. And Mm -hmm. I feel bad that I didn't voice it. I knew it was going to happen, and it's a very unstable country. But can you imagine the Sandinistas getting a phone call from uh, an American in New York City saying, hey, fellas, you know, I really think you're going to have some bad earthquakes. Yeah, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks, amigo. (laughs) Hey, gringo, you trying to scare us? You know, that would have been... Because you know what? They did it the last time. They were warned in 1972. This was the Somoza uh, era. Mm -hmm. And they were warned that this earthquake was of an incredible magnitude, and it was coming, and an American geologist was there, and he worked with four Howard Hughes, 
People don't know that Howard Hughes settled down in Nicaragua. To uh, He left the United States. He fled the publicity. And he settled in Managua, Nicaragua for the last few years before the earthquake. So the geologists warned Howard Hughes and warned the Nicaraguan government. And Hughes was smart enough to get on an airplane, and he left. And the geologists waited till the last plane out, and he left. And the others, and the the argument was the same argument. Right. The, the what did I say? The egg on the face. The war of the worlds or egg on your face. Uh, Robert, were, I remember hearing it, the exact same thing unfold uh, five or six years ago when the big earth or big tsunami hit uh, uh, Malaysia or the yeah the uh, Malaysian oh, area. Oh yeah. And you know they had they, you know they, the people get really cranky when they have these uh, you know tidal wave warnings and then nothing happens and then but True. anyway and they get hey buddy we're all first. buddy we're all out of time my friend okay. <laughs> real quick real quick what are you are you working on anything that uh, you can tell us about next time you're on in a couple weeks oh yeah well right now I'm I'm really gearing up for this conference in California if I can give a little plug to the competition who's not at the same time on Friday on Red Red Ice Creations mm-hmm. Red, Red Ice Radio. I, I did a two-hour interview uh, for European for European audience uh, about yeah, geopolitical. They do, there. they do good programs on red ice. Oh yes, very yeah, nice. Yeah, I like them. And uh, the the eye of the eye of Mars during this. Let's get another show because I want to tell you, I got a photograph of the eye of Mars, the thing I've been talking about since, 19, since 2003 that well, NASA the, has ever shown a photo of. The I next time you're on, let's. The telescope. The next time you're on, let's let's put that photo on a page if you want, and we can uh, have at it on that one. Very good. Robert, thanks a lot. Always good talking to you, and I'll talk to you in the meantime. Okay. Take care. That is our program for this evening. Thanks for being with us. Tomorrow night, Dr. Larry Lytle will be back with us, and he'll be talking about how the uh, improper alignment of our teeth, our jaw bite, uh, can seriously affect our health in very many unexpected ways. This will be a fascinating conversation. That's it for me. Take care. Be well. Be back tomorrow night with more Far Out Radio. Small business entrepreneurs, do you want to optimize your website, get more business, but your budget is small? So what's your wish list? A professional look, a blog site where you edit and create pages yourself integrated with social media tools? This is Jeff Rents for FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com with Scott and Karen Teeters. You can get a great-looking turnkey 3.0 WordPress website very inexpensively. Your new site will be professionally designed, set up fast with search engine, social media, and blog optimization. And you'll be trained how to easily maintain your own new site. Get a free consultation today with absolutely no obligation obligation from freespiritdesignstudio.com. Take the first step to owning a site that your business deserves, created by freespiritdesignstudio.com.